All right, well, why don't we get started? Welcome again. Uh, my name is Rob Hammond, and I am the, the director of the SASI Center. Uh, thank you for joining us today with our class with Bonte Pisana. Uh, just as a brief introduction, uh, uh, he was born in Vienna in 1975, and he was in, ordained in Sri, Sri Lanka in 1997. Abante Pasana lived and practiced in monasteries and forest hermitages in Sri Lanka for 17 years. And from 2014 to 2019, he spent time in the Metta Vihara uh, in Germany. And since then, he's been living in an independent hermitage in a cottage in rural Germany. Um, and with that, I will hand it off to Abante Pasana. All right. Uh, thank you, Rob, for the introduction. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, glad to be able to join you for the second time now. Um, have some good memories about our first meeting with interesting discussions. And uh, hopefully we can do the same uh, this time. All right. Um, so now I uh, welcome everybody to our um, Dhamma evening, Dhamma forenoon, wherever you join from. Um, a very interesting topic about uh, Dukkha and what it means and how, how to understand it, how to liberate ourselves from it. But before we dive into all of this, I want to start out with a meditation uh, to calm the mind, to prepare the mind. Uh, make the mind a vessel for the Dhamma so we can uh, have our complete attention on the wonderful wisdom of the Buddha. So I'll have a minimalistically guided meditation for you at the beginning for about 25 minutes. start out by bringing our attention to the process of breathing in and breathing out within our bodies. Without the need for any specific focus on where to feel the breath, we just allow this notion of breathing to draw our attention inwards into the body, into the present moment.
without any attempt to manipulate the flow of the breath. Just allow it to be the way it is right now. Maybe long or short, coarse or subtle. Just try to experience the breath in the body. Was so mindful, and was so present. The clear mind.
Mindfully, we breathe in and breathe out. Experiencing the whole body. Allowing this body to become a, a frame of mindfulness. Vessel for a direct experience of the present moment. One breath at a time.
feeling safe and calm, this uh, framework of mindfulness in the body. And little by little, let go thoughts about the activity to change um, our well-being in the outside world. Allow to calm down the stress that comes along with involvement in the outside world. Allowing the mind to rest within the body.
Oh, I hope you um, have a nice and peaceful mind now that is not distracted by the worldly concerns. So we can um, together explore this wonderful Dhamma of our Lord Buddha. Um, yeah, so we have this um, uh, essential topic before us, uh, the topic of uh, Dukkha. Um, uh, so it's really essential to the whole uh, Dhamma project we are following as uh, Dhamma practitioners. And even the suttas, of course, this is a frequently used term, um, central to all our endeavors uh, on uh, understanding reality. And sometimes when uh, uh, several suttas were uh, right at the end, maybe the discussion got a bit uh, too complicated or too um, uh, far uh, leading to leading astray or whatever. And the Buddha would like to summarize it um, in this uh, simple sentence, all I formally as well as now, uh, all I teach is Dukkha and the end of Dukkha. So we we see this is really uh, the, the main concern the Buddha has in, in uh, teaching uh, people like us and, and, and uh, uh, sharing his vision uh, of inner peace. Um, because then there's nothing more um, uh, um, in his interest than uh, wanting to uh, show us how to understand Dukkha and how to make it stop. So it's uh, really, um, if there's any essence of the Dhamma, then we can say that's the essence. And um, right now you might wonder why I leave it untranslated at first and um, st still use the Pali term uh, Dukkha, but uh, intentionally I want to leave it untranslated, not uh, um, at first and want to uh, work together with you to find uh, um, some, the, the actual meaning of this word because it's not all that simple. Um, actually, I'm, my experience as well as my own experience as a practitioner um, uh, as well as uh, my experience as someone who is fortunate and honored to, to help and guide other peoples in their meditation is that this is a actually serious um, source of misunderstandings in the Dhamma practice uh, that we don't have a clear picture of what Dukkha can mean in which uh, circumstances. So um, the original meaning of the Dhamma can be quite misunderstood if we uh, develop, if we build up our practice on maybe an inadequate uh, translation of the word Dukkha. If that, just for example, most of you might be familiar with the term suffering. If we take that as a given translation that fits all the, all the uh, contexts and situations the Buddha is using this term Dukkha, um, uh, the strategy to free ourselves from this dukkha might become unclear because as human beings, uh, we already might have a particular um, own take on this word, have already a, a life of experience and, and, and usage of language. We already might have charged this particular word suffering with a meaning. Now, obviously, I'm not a native. English speaker, but when I hear the word suffering, I think of someone maybe crying or in pain and kind of visibly being shaken and suffering. And, uh, suffering means someone is suffering. And that's not really um, um, the full picture of what the Buddha means with this uh, 
so important um, on Docker. So it's uh, crucial to concern ourselves with the correct definition of, of Docker. And um, for that, we have to um, look into the context the Buddha is using the term. We have to adapt to the context. If we, if we try and um, yet maybe a bit of unfortunate heritage we have from the uh, early Buddhist translators uh, who had this vision to find one universal translation for each Pali term. So it was the, the, their, their uh, honorable the, uh, ambition, but maybe not also useful ambition. Like if there's, if there's a, one word in the Pali language, uh, wherever it appears in the text, it also has, we have to find one translation uh, that is always in use for whatever context it is. And that can uh, create some misunderstandings, as we will see. Um, can be actually um, a little bit sad at times to see that people really um, put in a lot of effort and good intentions in their practice, but maybe get these uh, basic fundamental um, um, meanings in, uh, of these central terms in their practice a little bit wrong. And we can see how the whole angle of what their practice is aiming towards can be quite uh, distorted and then maybe the practice goes astray in the worst case scenario goes astray or at least doesn't doesn't uh, go the, um, the direction the Buddha intended for us. Yeah. Um, yes, there's already, already some comments appearing. If you, the, uh, I forgot to mention there will be uh, opportunity for an exchange at the end of our meeting and so we can if you have anything to contribute please remember it maybe note it down for a later discussion um, there are uh, uh, other translations as well which we will, which we will um, uh, talk about just for the person who Sent a note, unsatisfactoriness is also one translation we will discuss. Um, yeah, but uh, I hope we can agree that there is a certain, a specific outcome of our Dhamma practice as the Buddha intended it. And in our modern times, we might think, well, everyone, everyone is finding their own path and there's, uh, this is uh, a liberal path of liberation, which obviously everyone can, can choose and find their own way of practice. But if we are interested in the original meaning of the Buddha's teachings, it's sometimes worth taking a while to um, reflect and analyze. Um, and it's uh, hardly any place where it would be more rewarding as here with our topic about Dukkha. So what is Dukkha? We will probe in it now in theory, but also after my little talk here, I will try to put it into practice because that's obviously the most important part of it. Um, but theory and practice sometimes um, uh, are, uh, should work together to get the optimum result. And when we, um, just by um, carefully reading and studying the suttas, we will uh, arrive at the conclusion that the Buddha uses this term dukkha in different contexts, uh, mainly in three different contexts. Um, but always the same word, the word dukkha is used but not for the same purpose. So, uh, we can almost say this word dukkha is something like a uh, homonym, a 
a word that, that can have different meanings in different situations. Another word that always um, comes up uh, in translations as in German as well as in, in, in English is the word right. That would be a good example for such a homonym. Uh, right can mean just the direction or it can mean distinguishing between right and wrong or in modern days it can even describe the, the political uh, views of a person and all is achieved with this one same word. So like that the word dukkha um, for the Buddha is not necessarily always the same. It can mean slightly different things in different contexts and these contexts usually for a, a, a keen reader of the suttas uh, uh, can be deducted from the, the, the context of the discussion, right? So um, just by just by studying the suttas, we can arrive at this insight and what these uh, three types of uh, usage of the word dukkha is now will be the, the topic of my presentation. But interestingly enough, um, there's even a sutta uh, that um, talks about three types of suffering. That's actually the, the, the our sutta, the main sutta that uh, we chose as a the topic for uh, Dhamma morning, Dhamma evening. Mm. And that's the Tukka Panha, Panha Sutta, the, about the, uh, someone has a question about Dukkha. And that's the, the first sutta we're going to look at together. If there's, maybe I'll find a volunteer who's ready to read it out, all of us. Just the uh, English, put the Pali underneath. So if you're interested, you can look at it. But would anyone like to read the English translation? Please. I think you can just turn on your mic and start reading. Vandana okay. Lal. Okay. Thank you, Arjun. So I start from a question about suffering. Yes, please. Okay, and then I should just read the English, right? Yes, please trust the English. A question about suffering. Reverend Sariputta, they speak of this thing called dukkha. What is this dukkha, Reverend? There are these three forms of dukkha. The dukkha of unpleasant, the dukkha of const const constructness, and the dukkha, um, yeah. and the dukkha of change. These are the three forms of dukkha. But Reverend, is there a path and a practice for completely understanding these forms of dukkha? There is, it is simply this noble eightfold path that is. Right view, right attitude, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right collectedness. This is the path and the practice for completely understanding these forms of dukkha. Yes, thank you very much for reading it out. And I have to apologize or um, ask my English audience whether this funny word construedness makes any sense to you. I, I think it's a, a word I just invented, but it's just uh, supposed to mean um, that there's something construed about it, right? Something um, artificially constructed. Uh, just to make clear what the meaning of this unusual word. And now we heard about this, basically three types of Dukkhas. The, the, in this case, not the Buddha, but the Venerable Sariputta, which is of course a very reliable source of information um, uh, shared with us or with this uh, particular audience he had. And we find the three types of Dukkha. We, uh, I want to go through with you now. The first was Dukkha Dukkha. 
which is uh, quite commonly uh, agreed upon to mean uh, unpleasant feeling, dukkha vedana, which is, uh, um, so we can equate it to this unpleasant feeling or call it the, the dukkha of unpleasantness. Uh, and dukkha vedana is just one part of uh, uh, every human experience. You know, this vedana, this uh, uh, feeling or uh, sensation. Uh, the last time we talked about the five uh, kandas, if someone, any of you were present, then uh, I think I prefer to translate the sensation. It's basically this emotional evaluation of, of the, the contacts we have through the six sense doors. Uh, there's, a, there's a sound and attention drawn to the sound and there's uh, ear consciousness arising and that's what we call ear contact. And then the mind starts to evaluate, what is it? Maybe we recognize it as a bird chirping and then we find that to be pleasant, or maybe it's the neighbor's TV uh, uh, being uh, noisy again, and then we interpret it as unpleasant. So this uh, way of uh, how we feel about a certain sense contact is what is meant by uh, Vedana. And this Vedana has three uh, possible uh, uh, grades. The, the, the pleasant, the unpleasant, and the neutral, somewhat in the middle, where we can't really decide which of it uh, it might be. Uh, but it's not clear how we position ourselves. So that's a that's an essential part of any experience, regardless how uh, uh, the deluded or enlightened a person is. Um, this is just how the human mind works, right? And this is also uh, a basic. Uh, uh, function of the mind uh, without which we could not make any decisions or have any um, any any feeling of what to do next and what we prefer or like and dislike. Mm. So it's 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 necessary part of uh, human experience, you might say. What we're also very familiar with is the usual um, reaction we have um, to, an, to an unpleasant uh, feeling. This is kind of, oh, I don't like it. It's really, when it's unpleasant, it means it's, I'd, I'd rather prefer not to have it. So there's a natural urge in us to avoid it. And uh, the urge to avoid it is, expresses itself in a search for the opposite for a, a pleasant sensation, for a pleasant feeling that we have so much prefer to the unpleasant one. Now, the thing is, when we hear the Buddha talk about the liberation from Dukkha and um, all the, all the um, uh, knowledge we have about Dukkha is that it can mean unpleasant sensations, we might, uh, uh, slide into a, mis a big misunderstanding, but about uh, ah, then the Buddha is talking about uh, getting rid of unpleasant feelings, and that sounds actually quite appealing to the mind because who wouldn't like to have a life without unpleasantness, right? So we might um, on 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 misconstruing liberation from dukkha to be freedom from unpleasantness, uh, we might imagine a purely pleasant state, at least a never again unpleasant state, uh, and then uh, obviously try to achieve it and, and get closer to this wonderful, uh, blissful state. Mm. We might we might say that this is this is the Dhamma, our limited human mind comes up by itself without the help of a awakened Buddha. That's how we uh, uh, invent a, a solution to the uh, problem of of dukkha by thinking, oh, uh, 
Docker is not nice. Uh, uh, pleasant things are nice. So let me get the good stuff. And and when we look around, uh, when we look at our own lives, and even here, when you look at this Windows and this whole civilization, it's basically built on um, making our lives more comfortable, getting more of the pleasant feelings and less of the unpleasant feelings. So um, now we learned what uh, what uh, Dukkha can mean. We learned here also, uh, for example, that each uh, Dukkha concept has something like an opposite Sukkha concept. When, when uh, a Dukkha is the unpleasant or the, the suffering or the, the uh, unsatisfactoriness, then Sukkha is the opposite, is the, the bliss and the pleasant and the satisfaction of uh, according to context. So and uh, each of those dukkhas has its uh, correspondent uh, sukkha uh, concept coming along with it. And the, the sukkha concept for unpleasant feeling is obviously pleasant feeling. And, and if we misinterpret uh, dukkha uh, vedana, unpleasant feeling, as being our arch enemy and the, the thing we should try to liberate ourselves from, then the obvious conclusion, however wrong it may be, at least it's logic, uh, uh, would be to uh, trying to attain a permanent uh, pleasant abiding, a constant pleasant feeling uh, and the highly illusional uh, hope to attain to ever attain uh, uh, constantly pleasant abiding mm. uh, which which might lead to a lot of disappointment and exhaustion when we actually uh, try to get there and mm, not to underestimate the danger of the of this uh, small misunderstanding also for any meditation and spiritual practice because uh, quite often we uh, I, I honestly have to have to uh, admit is part of it uh, of my own experience but I also saw it many times with practitioners that uh, when we have an unpleasant phase in our lives uh, we tend to be highly interested in the Buddha's teaching and we run to one retreat and the next and meditation classes can't be enough. But then when there's a, a, a nice and pleasant uh, a streak in our life, then all of a sudden we think, oh, it's all, maybe the Dhamma is not so necessary because I feel all right anyways. So it's also indication that we might misunderstand what uh, what this whole Dhamma project is actually meant for. There's much more at stake than just uh, feeling a bit more pleasant and a little, a little less unpleasant. And how how futile uh, any attempts at uh, gaining uh, permanent uh, happiness by stabilizing our pleasant feelings might be is uh, the impermanence of it all. That's uh, Second dukkha that is uh, described here in our sutta, and the first one was the dukkha dukkha, the dukkha of unpleasantness, and now we have the dukkha of change and impermanence, the viparinama dukkha. And that, as already someone has mentioned in the in the chat, uh, is actually quite well translated as unsatisfactory. It is this, this dukkha of the unstable, the viparinama dukkha. You could call it uh, the inability to to gain real satisfaction. But I'm going to talk about a bit more this uh, logic connection. Uh, so viparinama, the word might be less familiar than the word anicca, but it means basically the same. Viparinama means like it's it's. It doesn't stay in the same shape. It bends and changes. And that's a very good description of uh, how we start to see our own experience once we start to look at it with wisdom. Mm. 
when maybe to make it a bit uh, uh, more understandable when we talk about uh, unpleasant feeling it's the the feel of it right it right? it feels not nice and this one feels nice and this not and now here with the 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 dukkha of the unstable we talk about not how it feels we covered that already with the first dukkha here we talk about how it behaves and that's a, a big uh, point of confusion because um when the buddha says whatever is Anicca, whatever is impermanent, is necessarily dukkha. He does not mean that whatever is impermanent is feeling unpleasant. So if we think that that's what the Buddha means, we start to um, get into trouble. Uh, we might uh, rightly uh, criticize the Buddha for and say, well, that's a bit pessimistic, sometimes Although it changes, sometimes maybe it's also pleasant. So why is the Buddha uh, stating that it's always unpleasant? That's not according to my experience, right? So uh, without misunderstanding the Buddha here, um, it's not about how pleasant or unpleasant it feels. It's about what uh, ability it has or has not. And whatever is impermanent, lacks the ability to satisfy us. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever is anicca, uh, impermanent, is dukkha, is uh, in, in, the, in the suttas we find it so often, this uh, logic uh, uh, connection, and it's hardly ever um, questioned or, or, or challenged. Right? So we see that um, for 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 the logic of the of 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 Indian thinking two and a half thousand years ago, it that was that was uh, not uh, under dispute. Now it's, uh, nowadays in modern context, uh, I made different experiences uh, with myself, but also with uh, people like you who would really, in all seriousness and honesty, try to understand it deeply and uh, really. We, we have to understand it in a deep and personal way so that it, that it can affect us. Mm. So uh, we also really have to deeply investigate this uh, connection between Anicca and Dukkha in order to clear away with this uh, uh, really dangerous misunderstandings. Mm. So experience can be pleasant, of course, as we all know, but still at the same time, um, it won't be truly satisfying because it continuously keeps moving and changing in, in, on a big scale, on a small scale, um, and on every, every, every possible way we might think about it or we might observe it. Right? Uh, we, might we might observe that uh, the body changes. That's more of more of the big scale. And uh, when I was twenty years old, my skin was so flawlessly beautiful, and now it gets wrinkles and specks and uh, gray hairs here and there. And it's uh, it's it's changing, and it's not the same as it was. And one might regret it. One might one might understand that um, having having a youthful body is not satisfying because it doesn't last you can't rely on it and so I've, sometimes i had i personally sometimes the feeling that especially people who uh, might uh, strongly identify with their their beauty maybe some hollywood actors or actresses uh, to the, whose whose identity might to a certain degree be uh, uh, built up on this uh, on their external appearance, and then once that starts to change and to crumble, uh, that can be really a big uh, a big uh, uh, a disappointment or a big crisis in such people's lives, because um, uh, what they what they experience to be unquestionably pleasant at the time 
when we were young and beautiful and everyone loved them for their beauty, that was a very pleasant experience. No, no need to deny that, but it didn't last. So it really, it is not really satisfying, right? even when we look at it on this very basic big scale uh, uh, way. And it becomes all the more true when we, when we narrow down our focus, get into a more microscopic view of impermanence as being part of our experience every moment we are alive and conscious, right? Because every moment of, of while we think and breathe and feel and whatever is part of our experience, even right now in this moment, um, it cannot last. It has to change and turn into a next present moment and the next present moment. And we, however much we try to get something out of it, it will always change and become otherwise. So there's no, no, no staying the same, no, uh, no true rest in this, uh, in this uh, forced movement that our experience simply is. We have to move on from moment to moment. No one's asking us whether we want it that way or not. It's just happen, right? So there's this, this um, unsatisfactoriness of impermanence in each and every moment of our living experience. It takes a bit more uh, patience and more uh, 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 clarity of view to start to, to see and realize and understand. So, um, but that's part of our that's part of our work here in the in the Buddhist practice. No one said that um, understanding what dukkha is is obvious and given. So we have to we have to earn this clarity by investigating. And this connection between anicca and dukkha is actually quite important. Um, Sometimes, especially in, in our modern uh, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, um, practices, it's sometimes a bit uh, uh, confused maybe or, or neglected because we might, we might think uh, there's, there has to be a positive outcome of witnessing change in my Vipassana meditation. So easily that it gets a spin off uh, this flow of impermanence and we just flow along with it and then it's all right uh, but maybe it's it's not all that simple right we there's we can if we if we are, are daring enough we can uh, challenge this easy uh, easy access to to peacefulness and uh, take the take the buddha a bit more serious when he talks about the uh, unsatisfactoriness of suffering and also the importance of understanding that right? there's some of some of some of my uh, uh, German and Austrian friends who also uh, uh, joined in might already know the quote that's coming now it's one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite uh, uh, Buddhist writers he's uh, from the last century already it's called Paul Dahlke, uh, uh, in, at least in the in the uh, German-speaking world, uh, uh, famous, well-known, uh, one of the pioneers of of German Buddhism, and he put out this very interesting statement. I, I tried my best to put it in English. So let's see how it works. Um, so his 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 statement to, to exactly to this. Uh, a connection of anicca and dukkha as unsatisfactory. Um, so the completeness of our liberation will depend on the completeness of our understanding of the fact that what is impermanent is dukkha. Was that understandable? Shall I say it once more? All right, the, the completeness of our liberation 
will depend on the completeness of our understanding of the fact that what is impermanent is unsatisfactory. Right? If our understanding of this unsatisfactoriness of the impermanent is not complete, our liberation will also not be complete. Uh, for the simple reason that this understanding of, of the dukkha of the impermanent um, is uh, one of the big uh, um, arguments uh, for our letting go of uh, grasping and identifying with these impermanent experiences. Right? Seeing the disadvantage of the impermanent, our mind readies itself to let go of it. So we have to we have to at, at least um, at, even if we are not uh, all at once the same of the same opinion as the Buddha, uh, give him a chance and give him give him here uh, this uh, the the depth of this interpretation. Uh, the Buddha is uh, posing that uh, not lasting satisfaction is no real satisfaction at all. And if we think about it, it really does make sense, although it's not uh, a pleasant truth at first. Mm. And but it it reflects very well the this uh, 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 unbelievably uh, refined uh, spiritual palate or taste of an awakened being that. Uh, 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 our Bodhisattva, our Prince Siddhartha, he was presented with all the pleasantnesses of three palaces and all this uh, uh, worldly amusement. But there was there was a refinement in his taste that could taste this uh, uh, bitterness of disappointment and unsatisfactoriness in all of that. Uh, that's what that's what sent him on his on his uh, uh, a noble search. Which is a search that's more more refined than the search for fun in the world. Then um, there's there's um, also a very important uh, trap of uh, misunderstanding uh, concerning this topic. Um, now, once we accept the the, the unsatisfactoriness of the impermanent, we uh, obviously will uh, want to find a solution for this unsatisfactoriness. And then there's this big uh, um, seemingly logical, but uh, a fatal attempt uh, to transform, transform that which is impermanent and uh, unsatisfactory into something that is permanent and satisfactory. Uh, that seems the obvious the obvious exit. Well, then let me find something that's not impermanent and therefore not unsatisfactory. And uh, we can't count how many religious and spiritual ideas in this world work with this basic logic. Uh, um, I think it's quite uh, uh, quite uh, understandable that uh, uh, all around the world, people with a certain gift for spirituality, with a certain refinedness of their spiritual tastes, start to understand that the normal sensual world um, uh, is impermanent and not satisfying. And that they also start their own uh, searches for answers, right? But uh, then it seems uh, quite often, the 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 road they take is uh, the road to a, a presumed uh, permanent safety that is not yet discovered, but um, for sure must lurk somewhere in the background of my mind, or is a myth mythical place somewhere I only have to reach, and then I'll be safe. Um, so there ensues a. Uh, fervent search for the permanent. Under many different names, uh, our human mind is extremely creative to uh, create all kinds of images or, uh, or names or philosophical explanations for that. 
Mm -hmm. And it really seems to be something like a basic instinct of of the unawakened mind to to react to a view of the unsatisfactoriness of the impermanent with a, a strong desire, a strong longing for anything permanent. Right? Even if if I may, as a side note, say um, um, this 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 basic instinct of the human mind seems to be so powerful that even within the realm of Buddhist practice, um, it uh, again and again tries to take a foothold or wherever, wherever human thinking, although inspired by uh, the Buddha, uh, starts to move away from a very um, um, uh, basic uh, orientation on the early uh, authentic word of the Buddha, uh, there we, we can uh, observe that slowly, slowly these uh, elements of uh, uh, my mythical permanence are reintroduced. Right? So uh, it really needed uh, the rigorous, the, 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 the uncompromising attitude of the Buddha to, to um, shush away this uh, lust for permanence uh, as long as he lived, but then uh, quite soon, um, when when early Buddhism met other uh, cultures and other traditions, uh, whatever wonderful and beautiful uh, products that might have uh, uh, brought to this world, uh, it also seemed to have uh, again and again uh, brought to surface this uh, basic urge of the human mind to find something stable beyond the unstable. And that's really uh, a big misunderstanding of uh, of the Buddha's teaching, and a big misunderstanding of these different types of uh, dukkha. That's uh, one of the main reasons why this this is such a rewarding topic of contemplation to clarify some of those uh, traps we might uh, otherwise uh, unknowingly uh, walk into. And of, uh, of course, I'm 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 not here to blame anyone's practice as far from my intentions, uh, but I thought this might be a helpful clarification for some of you. Just one just one last uh, point on that topic is that uh, um, we see that this is a very good example on uh, for what uh, the mental bias can do to our meditation practice because uh, if we have this bias of uh, uh, wanting to find something permanent this can start to corrupt the clarity of our um, uh, direct insight uh, uh, with, with direct insight i mean it's a very clear and um incorruptible uh, observation of the present moment and we see all the thoughts coming and going and feelings and whatever we whatever uh, comes into the range of experience we can observe as impermanent but then there must be a certain point um, where the bias of this wish of finding something permanent kicks in and excludes a certain part of our experience we, we, we create a small sanctuary put a certain perception around it, like uh, coat it into something, into like this waterproof uh, bubble and uh, refuse uh, uh, our direct uh, 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 tool of probing uh, of uh, inside to, to penetrate this bubble. And so we, we try to reserve a certain area of experience um, uh, so we can project our uh, longing for permanence there. And uh, if we simply continued to do the practice without um, giving any parts of experiences, any special uh, sanctuaries, that could easily be resolved, but it needs this uh, willingness to let go of uh, uh, um, the bias that's, that's underneath it. This one, 
one quite uh, funny uh, simile the Buddha is giving about a young man who's uh, in love with the most beautiful girl in the country. And then he's asked by his friend, ah, really, I'm so happy for you. And uh, how does she look like? Is she tall or rather small? Or uh, what color of hair and what color of skin? And he wants to know all the details. But then this uh, young man says, oh, I don't know, because I don't know her, actually. But I, I'm just in love with the most beautiful girl uh, of the country, uh, whoever that may be. Right? So he's, he is not in love with any actual real girl, but in love with this abstract idea of one must be the most beautiful, and that's the only one I, I desire. And so... Um, being in love with the permanent is actually quite similar. We, we have some abstract attributes which we uh, project onto something, but we don't really know it. Okay, now um, um, there's one more dukkha on our list to understand. That is the uh, in our sutta, uh, the Sankara dukkha, which I so... Um, Maybe it was a construed translation, you might say. Um, I try to translate as the dukkha of construedness, making a, a noun out of construed, right? And this is this, uh, um, again, something different than the unpleasant feeling and something different than this uh, unsatisfactoriness of impermanence. This the, the stress of construing. And this is, uh, in fact, the Sankara Dukkha is very similar to, uh, to grasping, to Upadana, which we find as a definition for a Dukkha in the Four Noble Truths. As you want, all of you might be familiar with it, uh, in the First Noble Truth, the Buddha defines uh, Dukkha. First, he lists the uh, examples of uh, being subject to birth, old age, uh, uh, death, and uh, unfulfilled desires, and so on. And then, um, in summary, or um, in as an as a the essence of all that, it's the five khandas uh, together with grasping. The five khandas in the mode of grasping is the the basic definition of uh, dukkha in this uh, four noble truth context. And we see that something, again, completely different to just feeling unpleasant or to uh, having to bear with, the, with impermanence. This is, this is uh, uh, made by grasping. So grasping, we could, we could define this grasping as something like an automatic urge, not by some external entity, but by exactly these five uh, part of experience, consciousness, and uh, objects it, 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 it experiences. Um, the automatic urge of our, the part of our experience to cling to each other and to create a sense of identity by this clinging. So it's they, they try to create something more compact, more real than it actually is just uh, by and of itself. Now this Interestingly enough, this mental behavior is not something that's under our direct control. We can't just right now decide whether we want to grasp or not. Right? Because uh, the causes for this grasping to occur is not whether we want it to occur or not. If that were the reason, we could just uh, wish it away and be happy ever after. But it has deeper causes than that. These deep causes are um, our mental conditionings and our ignorance, basically. This avicca as the driving force behind uh, the behavior of an unawakened mind. So we 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 are as long as we are not liberated, we not liberated ourselves from the influence of ignorance, we are, are forced to live with this frustration of wanting to grasp something where there actually is nothing to hold on to. 
where there's no one to be able to hold on to. Why? Because anything we possibly ever experience is impermanent and not satisfactory. Ignorance is just another way of saying we do not understand Dukkha, which can also mean we um, we mix up these different types of Dukkha and take one for the real for the real thing and try and see it as our main problem and and focus on fixing that problem and thereby just creating the actual real problem, which is this uh, 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 grasping induced Dukkha, this state of uh, um, uh, uh, stress, this state of um, forced forced uh, mental behavior of trying to accumulate and possess and identify. Which often we, we might be completely ignorant of. Again, uh, thanks to ignorance uh, working so well in the background uh, because uh, because this might appear to us as suffering only when we start to uh, gain some foothold in uh, mental states with less suffering and less ignorance and thereby create the ability to compare and to contrast. And then by contrast, we can easily decide, oh, this grasping, I never noticed it, but now that I can compare states of more grasping and less grasping, oh, it's obviously uh, much more stressful to grasp and much more peaceful not to grasp. So we, 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 it's something like a, a, a frustration of having this compulsion to identify with things that are no identity. So the wishing to, to be and uh, possess things that are mm, have nothing to do with the self, that are impermanent and, as mentioned, unsatisfactory. Um, are you still, um, is there still an appetite for more? Can we go on? Because I have an interesting uh, other sutta, just to prove my point a little bit. It's just a small fraction of the Parileya Sutta, which uh, shows this um, similarity of Sankara, this uh, construedness and uh, Upadana, the grasping. Anyone like to, to read for us? Please, Christine. Christine, brother, I guess. Please. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, good. They regard corporeality and the other four conda as a self, or corporeality as the possession of a self, or corporeality as part of a self, or a self as a part of corporeality. Rupa a taught Oh, I'm not supposed to read this. Okay. But that regarding is just a construedness. And what's the source, origin, birthplace, and inception of that construedness? When an unlearned ordinary person is contacted by feelings, born of ignorance tainted contact, craving arises. That construedness is born from that. Yes, thank you very much for reading. So this is basically, if if we if we um, analyze that through the lens of uh, a dependent arising, just another way of saying identity view. This view that uh, uh, the parts of our experience have anything to do with the self is uh, the same as grasping, because what we what we what we hear here is that. Um, uh, ignorance tainted contact leads to uh, a feeling. This feeling leads to a craving, and this craving, usually in the, the context of dependent arising, would lead to grasping. But here we hear that it leads to construedness, um, which is then uh, um, 
the driving force behind the mind uh, 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 construing an identity out of these five khandas. So just to, to, to bring it uh, closer together, this, uh, this suffering of uh, uh, the compulsion to construe an identity out of a fleeting passing uh, parts of experience. So now the big, the big understanding uh, can dawn that to understand this dukkha and this dukkha of construing and to remove, in, to remove its cause, this uh, ignorance induced craving, that's actually our direct goal in the Dhamma practice, right? And how do we accomplish that? By seeing the undesirable nature of grasping, since on the one hand, it itself creates this stress. And on the other hand, it is never successful because whatever it attempts to, to grasp at and uh, cling to uh, is unsatisfactory material that's impermanent and therefore not uh, ready to make us happy. Uh, we, we, we had our walk through these three types of, of dukkha and hopefully understood that the problem at hand for us as uh, meditators and practitioners is this uh, dukkha that is uh, caused by ignorance because ignorance is the one point where we can uh, uh, insert some influence in the whole system. We, we can try to, to only experience pleasant things however much we want. It will never be 100% successful. We can try to find anything stable and permanent and Again, it will be never uh, really successful, but we can try to transform ignorance into knowledge, into wisdom. And that, although not uh, possible uh, from one moment to the next, is possible in the long run by just uh, training the mind to see according to reality, to see it moment by moment with all the patience and equanimity we can master, uh, that uh, any attempt to grasp and identify is uh, not really uh, worthwhile it because it, uh, it leads to suffering. And at the other hand, by understanding um, the, the peacefulness of non-grasping, of non-construing, we can uh, start to uh, develop a liking for this uh, um, uh, informed state of non-grasping, which might, uh, uh, which, which obviously is not free from the unsatisfactoriness of the unpleasant, but it's something like um, making peace with that unsatisfactoriness. And it's not some, it's not a state that is free from the unpleasant forever and always, but it's, uh, we, we, we made peace with the fact that unpleasant experience is part of, of uh, existence, part of uh, experience, however long it uh, uh, continues. And the other hand, of course, if we take it in the, to the context of rebirth, then we find that by uh, eliminating uh, the suffering the, or the, 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 the stress, the dukkha of grasping, uh, will lead to a complete cessation of the other two dukkhas as well by finally appeasing and letting uh, extinguish this uh, uh, sansaric existence altogether. So let me let me close with one of my favorite quotes of the Buddha: um, "Etang santang." Etang panitang yadidang sabba sankara samato, which means this is peaceful, this is exquisite, namely the calming of all compulsions to construe. So, thank you for listening.
and I suggest we have a small uh, break of maybe, I don't know what you use, used to, maybe five minutes. Uh, you can refresh yourself and then we can have a, a meditation together on these three dukkhas and hopefully clarify it a bit more in your own personal experience. Okay, see you in five minutes. And I'd like to um, do a maybe 45 minutes meditation together with you and uh, walk us through this dukkhas so we can get a direct feel of it. And afterwards, looking forward to your comments and questions and we can have an exchange on the Dhamma. Let us first again build a framework of mindfulness. But directly putting our attention on the in breathing and out breathing of the body. We allow the activity of the mind might be still um, activated by listening to the Dhamma, calm down. No need to keep thinking about all these points right now. Right now, all we have to do is feel the breathing of the body. Really throughout the whole body. Allowing the mind to be interested, but passive at the same time. With each and every breath we take.
all that matters now is what we directly experience in the present moment in the body. With each mindful breath, we draw the mind's attention into the body.
Now let us start to observe experience as it shows itself in the present moment from particular aspect of that experience. The feeling cones, feeling shades of pleasantness, unpleasantness and um, neutral feelings. The place where the drama happens. Let us be strong and daring, directly looking at Vedana as it presents itself. And it's pleasant, it's pleasant. When it's unpleasant, it's unpleasant. When it's not clearly defined, it's neutral. Without falling in the usual strategies of avoiding and securing unpleasant or pleasant feeling. Without any fear or greed, partially observe the phenomenon called Vedana. Getting used to so sitting there as an uninvolved observer, observing the pleasantness of the pleasant, the neutralness of the neutral, and also to get to know our first dukkha, the unpleasantness, the unpleasant feeling.
when attention goes astray, we can steady it by bringing the breath back in the center of our attention. At the same time, while observing the pleasantness of the pleasant, the unpleasantness of the unpleasant, will quite obviously witness continuous change, the impermanence of this uh, process of experience. In fact, we can include all the aspects of our experience, not only the feelings, Observe Anicca, Viparinama, this twisting and changing, coming otherwise from moment to moment.
We watch the impermanence of our direct experience uncompromisingly not allowing anything to escape our mindful watch till we see not only a change the constant disappearance an involuntary inability to stay still to really be anything as a matter of fact each present moment collapses into the past one after the other mindfully open ourselves to the effect this view of impermanence may have on the mind allowing it to grow disenchanted this mass of impermanence Allowing the mind to see the impossibility of satisfaction in what is but a process of dissolution.
while we try our best to observe the impermanence of all aspects of experience, and while we continue to do that, we might experience this out of control urge to take whatever we experience personally, to connect it to our seeming identity, You observe this continuous cramp of grasping. Maybe get a glimpse of the stress and pain of this. I, this little feeling of I am, all this chaos of experience that so desperately tries to hold on to anything. Experience the impermanence 
satisfactoriness, a whole range of experience. Ever so patiently, we try to realize all these attempts at grasping, stabilizing, are not worth the pain, identity, What if the mind was able to let go this urge to construe meaning to fleeting processes? What if this thirst for stability and selfhood was finally quenched, not by gaining anything, by releasing any desire any attempt to hold on to.
if you have anything on your mind you want to share with us or ask um, on our topic of these different dukkhas, then please feel free just to unmute your mic and start talking, please. Vandana. Thank you, Bhante, for your teachings. It's always a good reminder to come back to the Four Noble Truths of suffering first <laughs> on the first one. Yeah, I just uh, like to share something, my own experience. So when I came to Buddhism five years ago, a lot of suffering, personal suffering. And then I, I saw Buddha as a doctor giving me some medicine, <laughs> medicine for the suffering. So I started, mm -hmm. I, I just turned toward meditation. And the meditation was so helpful for me. Then slowly the blissful experiences start to happen. And then mind be started becoming very calm. And now I can see uh, the insight started coming of why the suffering is arising. The causes of suffering are coming because of the mind clinging and craving mm -hmm. uh, and controlling nature. So for me personally, uh, then I started listening to Aya Kema and uh, Arjun Brahms, Jana. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, oh, I'm having those experiences now, maybe a little bit, not. Mm. Um, yeah, so for me personally, it worked really well for Shamta and Vipassana going side by side for me personally, mm. because I'm not very smart into investigation right away. My mind mm. is very calm and now I can feel it. I can see it. Yeah, thank you, Bhante. Uh, do. Very good. Yeah, that's the most important, most important part of our practice when we start to feel its its effect and its uh, relief, no? And it can come in so many forms. And, and because this Dhamma is good at the beginning and good in the middle and good in the end. And so there's is one taste of liberation wherever we uh, uh, are situated in the Dhamma. Beautiful. Yeah, but it's, also, but it's also absolutely true that these experiences are not permanent. Mm. Makes me feel very happy and blissful. <laughs> the time. And whenever I got into any kind of suffering, I jump back to, oh, I'm going to sit and have that experience again. But this mm -hmm. going back and forth is becoming a chore now, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's it's not really the solution to. Yeah, it is to, not <laughs> to, sugar, to sugarcoat it. Exactly, it's, exactly. We have to have to swallow it, if, even if the sugar coating helps us with swallowing. The, the real mm -hmm. medicine has to go down, in yeah. order to, to free us from this strange growth inside of our mind. This. Uh, I and my feeling is like a, a cancer growing in our mind. Badu. But there's, there's a therapy. <laughs> yes, that's exactly. <laughs> Which not necessarily always has to be pleasant. There's some, some pleasant phases of it, but sometimes it might also give us a, a hangover uh, when when we realize how how... How, how much we allowed ourselves to be illusioned about reality. Yes, Heidi, please. No need to hello. show hands, just turn on the mic and hello. I'm super nervous because I don't talk to people like really. So that's part of why I'm here. Um, except for like my sister and my mother and my daughter for like two years <laughs> for this kind mm. of stuff. So you brought up, you use like the impermanence of beauty for an example. And I would like to say that there is another side to it of like the person chasing that, trying to keep it. Or maybe you're very aware of how people uh, respond to things that you can't control. 
and you mm -hmm. know that it affects your life negatively. So personally, several times I've cut off all my hair. I've mm -hmm. put on, I have so many like aggressive tattoos even just so being passive aggressive, like stay away. Mm -hmm. And my last job was wildland firefighting. And I end up in the hospital, <laughs> not yeah. from fire, but because the anger that happens from people, which that's, I see it on many levels, they chase something, you're supposed to feel flattered, but it's not, like you say, when you use better example, when you say the person in love with the idea of the girl, that's mm -hmm. more how I see it. Mm -hmm. I don't even go outside now or interact with people because mm. I feel like I can't protect myself from that kind of grasping. Mm. I don't know if I can, and I think maybe it'll be better when I'm older. Mm. <laughs> and so it's different. Like I would like to be, I would like people to, Yes, I'm very aware of all of that. And I just, not just that one aspect, but when just noticing so much of why we care about each other period is dependent on so many other things, not just a physical appearance, but mm -hmm. I mean, like maybe it would be easier to leave my house if I had better social standing the things that people mm. assign assign to you that they think that they mm. that you are so not only it's what they think you look like but how much respect they think you deserve based on those things yeah and anyway that's a lot and it's a lot mm. for me to say that to people and i know i wasn't mm. using very buddhist language but i understand this very like very very personally and I would like to have a different relationship to myself so that I don't feel guilty or I feel like safe I guess so mm -hmm. that's all thank you yeah yeah thank you for sharing I think the best thing we all can do is um um getting to work in 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 training our mind the mind is uh, such a marvelous thing and in an untrained mind can cause so much uh, harm and suffering to ourselves and at the same time a trained mind can bring so much peace and quiet in our lives and it takes uh, a lot of patience and endurance to keep up uh, daily practice, even if it's not uh, fulfilling or blissful all the time. But just to just to to gain that uh, privilege of having a perspective on our own experience, rather than just being immersed in it and getting drowned in it is such a big relief. So if even if the content of our experience is not pleasant or satisfactory, um, it can bring us a certain relief by not being forced to, to be all of that, by right? training ourselves to be a patient observer and bystander who can uh, look at it but is not forced to be it all right so and of course that that not necessarily it will change how the world interacts with us that's uh, anyways a very hard ask to change the world to our uh, to our uh, image um 
but we can change our outlook in how we experience ourselves by just uh, um, um, and fighting for for this right to have a perspective on our own experience, which is, doesn't come cheap or easy. It's, it's a continuous effort to to keep this this one tiny corner where we can stand and look at our experience and not just getting sucked into it. But it's it's worth the effort. If I may. Dear Heidi, you already have some wisdom to notice how much other people's views are construed, <laughs> their, their own creations. And it's okay to find some space within yourself to not have that define your own experience. May you be well. Bhante, I wanted to ask how much you have used this um, understanding of dukkha to inform your understanding of the Anapanasati instructions, because it sounds like from your guided meditation, we, we did at least two out of the four, well, three out of the four tetrads. Um, do you have a kind of teaching around that or a structured way that you go about it? Um, the two are, of course, um, directly related. Um, I view this the whole um, exercise of, of, of uh, mindfulness and breathing uh, as a very uh, refined way to, to, to prepare the mind to really fully absorb the the uh, meaning of impermanence, as it were, like we find in the in the last chapter of the Anapanasati exercise, and um, the other the other tetrads have their their insights insights as well, but also have a big uh, contribution in preparing the mind to really be. Um, technically focused enough for one, but also um, be psychologically fit or psychologically unburdened enough to absorb the impacts of a nature in the right way. You know, so, so that uh, seeing the impermanence can turn to, uh, into dispassion and fading away and that can turn into uh, a direct look at the continuous disappearance of of our experience and then um, uh, uh, facilitating this uh, release of, uh, of allowing this uh, um, illusionary identity to fall apart. But uh, that's an interesting point. We can um, now um, obviously all this, all the three types of dukkha um, play their role in uh, releasing our mind from from this tendency to grasp and identify. I, I would not belittle this the the, the suffering of, of the unpleasant also because for for most people this is the 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 first encounter with uh, with dukkha and the first uh, driving factor to 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 search for uh, for answers and solutions, right? And it is it it often felt as such a relief to to it, at last hear someone talk about it so candidly as the Buddha does, and it's uh, that's one reason why existence can suck really because it's sometimes it's so painful and so unpleasant right um, but the main uh, arguments we try to 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 um, accumulate in our uh, uh, growth of wisdom is seeing the impermanence of of our experience and the unsatisfactoriness of that 
that's one of the that's the 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 basic data we have to collect and have to allow to to be absorbed in order to re, to to let go but also to understand the suffering and the stress of uh, identification and bringing those two together seeing that uh, if there's a there's a painful love for self but there's no way it actually exists and those two together the absurdity of the one and the, the painfulness of the other combined can bring about this uh, this uh, release of 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 this uh, this uh, compulsion to grasp right i missed the word there was a word there that i misunderstood is it um so you said there's two sides and one of the words didn't come through to me. Can you say that again? Is it possible? Um, oh. <laughs> We'd have okay. to rewind it. I know. It's hard, of, isn't it? Of, of what I just said now. Yeah. Oh, and it, it, the laugh of something, but the love of I, it was the, la love, uh, the love, love? The, the love, the love for an imaginary self, the love, love, love for an imaginary self. imaginary self, on the one hand, which which yeah. drives our desire, but then the painfulness of impermanence on the other side, and the, those two collide all the time. The wish to the, the wish to be permanent and the inability to be permanent that that's our mm -hmm. existential okay. uh, uh, problem dilemma yeah and yeah. and since we can't we can't change the one we can't change impermanence but we can change our love for ourselves <laughs> by, by um, um but by, by showing, love for Showing but, ourselves the disadvantages of what we love so much, and of right. finally understanding that it's that we love an illusion, just as this unfortunate young man is uh, madly in love with a concept of a beautiful girl and not any real girl. Not that that right. would be much better, maybe. <laughs> that's okay, that's is, really painful. Is, is love? The right word there, like it's a challenging word to put in that spot because, of course, we want to care for the being that is here. You know, there is, mm. you know, you know it's metta always, is important. It's like, <laughs> metta and yeah, compassion are important, but what do you mean by love in that sense? But it always depends on the context, right? I can, I can, in a in a worldly psychologically context, uh, love myself. But at the same time, try to out of, or maybe let's rather use the term meta, which is not the same as uh, love, uh, out of uh, genuine kindness, um, I do whatever I can to rid myself of this illusion of a self. As my my teacher, my teacher would like to 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 quip as the Venerable in Sri Lanka, and he. He liked the quip, uh, accept yourself and reject yourself. It's just one one blank space makes the whole difference. Yeah, yes, thank you. This is something that became clear. Why are we doing this? Uh, we follow the training because we love ourselves. Um, mm. Yeah, gentlemen, the, the training within which gentlemen who love themselves train, that struck me when yeah. I first it it's in the suttas but yeah. yeah why would we do this because we care <laughs> but at the mm -hmm. same time you don't want that attack that unwise attachment to some mm -hmm. constructed being okay yeah. thank I, you thank you or to or to allow that to allow that affection then to um uh meddle in the inside process we have a, can have a clear um, um, contribute the necessary uh, uh, work that has to be done, and for motivation and psychological healing, we can have all the matter uh, uh, we can master. But then, when it comes to the inside process, uh, it's 
it's also in the interest of meta not to interfere there and say, oh, but there are, what about the beautiful self that could be? And then it's our, our, the, this, this rather serious honesty of looking at our naked experience uh, might get uh, watered down or uh, be decorated with rose petals. And that's not what we need. Can I make a comment just to Heidi, please? Yeah, so if I look at Buddha as my role model and I look at his life, his own life before he was enlightened, so I see him doing a lot of meditation. And after that, the insight started arising. And then, so that's why I feel like Anapanasati needs to be practiced on a daily basis. For people like me, we need very calm minds to see something on a deeper level. So that's my suggestion that uh, that's what I started doing that, okay, I'm going to put this time for my meditation every single day, no, no matter what situation is arising. So every day, at least for half an hour, 40 minutes, and now increase to one hour in the morning. And then now meditation start happening on its own. I don't even have to put an effort. And then the insights slowly start to arriving that this is suffering these are the causes so for me i always give my own example to people that please trust in the anapanasati just mindfulness of the breathing no need to investigate anything at this point when you are too much you have so much suffering because when we are in pain we want just to pain to get go away and when the pain goes away for example if i'm having migraine i want it to go away right away and after that, I realized, oh, these are the factors contributing to my migraine on a regular basis. So what can I do to just get rid of those factors? And then now I have more control over my own sickness. That's what I see it as Buddha's teachings. Very great, great psychologist and a doctor. So if you trust in meditation, please, please, please just trust this. It will help you a lot. One more small sutta. Maybe we can read together as a farewell motto. Anyone like to read? I will. Please. Because if anyone should speak thus, without having made the breakthrough to the noble truth of Dukkha as it really is, the noble truth of the origin of Dukkha as it really is, the noble truth of the cessation of Dukkha as it really is, the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of Dukkha as it really is, I will completely make an end to Dukkha. This is impossible. Just as, because if someone should speak thus, having made a basket of acacia leaves, or of pine needles, or of myrobalan leaves, I will water, or time, I will bring water, or tiny seeds. This would be impossible. But because if anyone should speak thus, having made Oh, what happened? <laughs> um, yeah, but may I shortly will... interrupt you because just, just, just for, just for those, and then, you, and then please continue. Uh, just this tiny uh, observation for those who can't really imagine the, the, the simile here: uh, as a basket of acacia leaves, which are tiny, tiny leaves, or pine needles, or myrobalan leaves. Um, you you might with a, a lot a lot of uh, uh, craftiness be able to to maybe knit something like a a, a willow basket or something, but it will uh, be completely hopeless to just uh, trying to transport water or any tiny seeds in it. But um, in Asia, it's up to this day, and even I think in in America as well as in Europe and the countryside, um, there is this tradition of 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 weaving baskets out of plant materials. But here in the first instance, 
um, the basket that results of, uh, of uh, this uh, unsuitable uh, weaving material will not be able to, to carry water or tiny seeds. Yes, sorry, please continue. No, thank you, very good. Therefore, Bikus, an exertion should be made to understand. Ah, please, ah, sorry, please uh, go on here with but Bikus, oh. if anyone. <laughs> Yes, but because if anyone should speak thus, having made the breakthrough to the noble truth of Dukkha as it really is, the noble truth of the origin of Dukkha as it really is, the noble truth of the cessation of Dukkha as it really is, the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of Dukkha as it really is, I will completely make an end to Dukkha. This is possible. Just as, bhikkhus, if someone should speak thus, having made a basket of lotus leaves, or of kino leaves, or of maluva leaves, I will bring water for tiny seeds. This would be possible. Therefore, bhikkhus, an exertion should be made to understand. This is dukkha. This is the origin of dukkha. This is the cessation of Dukkha. This is the way leading to the cessation of Dukkha. Sadhu, sadhu. Sorry. Thank you for reading. And as with such uh, uh, mighty and also uh, waterproof leaves as the lotus leaf, uh, it is possible indeed to, and I, I uh, had such a, such a little bucket myself in the jungle in Sri Lanka, made out of uh, the the root of a huge palm leaf, and one actually really could store water in it. So um, it is possible now to come back to to the essence of that. It is possible by um, sorting out for ourselves what is really my problem, and if we have the the patience and humbleness to 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 allow ourselves to be uh, informed by the Buddha and his infinite uh, wisdom, uh, we can get a completely new perspective on, on Dukkha and what our problem really is. And we might understand that not only the problem, but also the solution to the problem lies nowhere else, but directly within ourselves. Uh, not in a way that we can with one act of wisdom or one act of will, uh, just uh, do away with all of it, but uh, by finding the tools to patiently, uh, uh, one of my favorite expressions was this fanatic patience, this fanatic patience to uh, be, the, be, be on the heels of this uh, Dukkha problem um, as much as we can and practice uh, cover uh, cover all the aspects of our life with this uh, wonderful eightfold path, so that slowly and gradually we can transform uh, the dukkha of uh, craving and grasping and illusion into a life of uh, uh, lightness and peacefulness of of not being forced to identify and um, allow finally to allow this whole. Um, process of existence to to cool down and to extinguish finally so that all suffering is liberated all right so hopefully uh, a worthy um, finale to our dhamma meeting um, thank you so much for the invitation and for your participation and uh, Please keep up the good work of uh, practicing in your homes and uh, uh, struggling to get up in the morning and squeezing in this one meditation before your busy uh, life uh, uh, start once more. And it's really worthwhile. So let us wish that all of us and all sentient beings attain freedom from suffering as soon as possible. Thanks. Wiedersehen, danke. Thank you very much, Bonte. Thank, thank you, you so much, very much for your teaching today. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us.
Uh, if you'd like you so to make much. a donation uh, to Vonte, I just put a link in the chat. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you once again for spending your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are with us. And uh, hope to see you again. And once again, thank you, Bonte. Take care, everyone. Well, it was a pleasure. Bye-bye.